So this morning we're going to continue our uh, sermon series here on the Sermon on the Mount. And we are looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. I'm going to read this text this morning from the NIV. Matthew 7, 7 to 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So the beginning and end of this are some of the most familiar words that Jesus ever spoke. Uh, If you've never been to church in your life, you are familiar with some of these phrases. Seek and you will find. Uh, Most people know that. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. This is called the golden rule in our world, and pretty much everybody has heard of it. And it comes from Jesus. Um, And I think this is a really encouraging passage. Um, This is a good news passage. This is a good one uh, for us this morning. And so I want to walk through this passage uh, and just explain what it's talking about. Ask, seek, and knock. Uh, These are three ways of saying the same thing. Look to God for whatever it is that you need. And at, at face value, at the most simple level, this verse says, if you need anything, ask God and he'll give it to you. That's, that's what the words say. Uh, and yet for any of us who've ever had unanswered prayers, which is all of us, uh, we know that it's not that simple. Um, sometimes we ask and we don't receive. So some translations, they focus on the Greek tense of these verbs, Um, which are continual tenses. So if you're reading this morning from a a New Living Translation, the NLT, uh, it doesn't say ask and you will receive. It says, keep on asking and you will receive. Uh, The Amplified Version says, ask and keep on asking. So it emphasizes being persistent, that we would continue asking, continue seeking. And it's true that you could translate these verbs that way. Uh, It's probably not the point that Jesus is trying to make, though. Um, if it is, then the point is, you know, it's being, about being consistent. And if your prayer, or persistent, I should say, isn't answered, you weren't persistent enough. Um, Luke has this same teaching with a, a parable attached. So if you have your Bibles, uh, flip over just to the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 11. And uh, this same ask and you will receive uh, passages in Luke 11. And, uh, and Jesus tells a parable to lead up to it in Luke. So Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 10. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity or persistence, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So in this story, the the first knock gets no answer. He asks, he's coming at a bad time, it's at midnight, Um, that's not culturally the appropriate time to to visit someone to ask, Um, but he's in need and he comes knocking and asking, and the the answer is no. Uh, But he keeps on knocking, he keeps on persisting, uh, and finally his friend gets out of bed and gives him what he wants. So we read this and say, see, if you just don't give up, if you just keep on knocking, eventually God will get out of bed and he'll help you. That's the opposite point to this passage. The point is that if this is how a bad friend acts, think how God is going to act in this. The reason we should ask God is not because he's like us and he'll eventually get out of bed and help us. Uh, We should ask God because he's not like us. God's not like us. We've created God in the image of man. He's not like us. He's willing to answer our first knock. There's another similar story in Luke 18 about a widow 
who goes to a judge asking for justice and, and she's begging and pleading with him and it says clearly this judge does not fear God or man but eventually he gives her what she wants because she's so annoying. We sometimes think that's what we've got to do with God. If we just keep asking, if we keep bugging him enough, eventually he'll give us what we want. And the point is, actually God's not like that at all. God's, God's good. He's for us. So we come back to this Matthew 7 passage and we think this passage is about us. Uh, it's not. This passage is about God. We're not the main character. God is. See, we focus our thoughts and our sermons on exactly how it is that we should ask and, and what does it mean to seek and what is knocking. We think if we can just figure out what Jesus meant by all this, we can get the results that he's talking about. So we examine our prayer lives from every possible angle. We write thousands of books on the topic, which is not all wrong. It's good to talk about what it means to ask and to seek and to knock. But if that's all we do, we've missed the point. Here's the point. Verses 9 to 11. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So Jesus uses a real-life example that everybody can relate to. Everybody's had parents. Uh, he uses an example that's ridiculous. There's nobody in the world who would do this. And in Jesus' world especially, uh, there's no parent who, if their child asks for bread, would give them a stone. And Jesus says, if you guys, being evil, do you like that? Jesus calls us evil. Uh, he says, if you broken, fallen, sinful people, know how to take care of your kids and answer their basic requests, don't you think your Father in heaven will do it a thousand times better? So the point is not in how you should ask or pray. Should you be on your knees or not? Should you finish with in Jesus' name a certain amount of time that you should spend in prayer? None of that. The point is not how you pray or how often you pray, but who you're praying to. This is what makes prayer effective. Not in the one who's praying, but in the one who's listening. This is why prayer works. Because on the other end of the line is a loving Father. See, other religions of Jesus' day, and even our day, uh, emphasize how far away and how distant their God is. And that's what makes their God great, because he's so great, he lives off somewhere in space somewhere. And it takes a lot of effort to reach a God like that. And even if you do it right, even if you go through jumping through all the hoops, don't expect much because there's actually a lot of people who are asking that God for stuff. But the more effort you put in, the more sacrifice, the better results you're going to get from that God. And sometimes this thinking creeps into our theology. You know, maybe God isn't answering this prayer. or Maybe he's not answering enough of my prayers. So we start to focus on our efforts. Maybe I need to get up at 4 a.m. every day and pray or Maybe I need to fast, or maybe I need to change my prayer language, start claiming things instead of asking for them. None of those are bad. God might lead us to do any one of those things. But my caution is that sometimes we focus far too much on our efforts and far too little on who is listening to our prayers. This passage wants us to focus on who is listening to our prayers. The people I know who have... Uh, successful prayer lives, are not always the one who pray uh, for two hours every day, though often they do pray a lot. But they're the ones who really know the Father's heart. They get what this passage is all about. They understand that God is a good Father in ways that others don't. One of the things that I love to do is read biographies of famous Christians from the past and one of the first, maybe it was the very first biography I ever read, was of a man named George Mueller. Uh, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with George Mueller. Uh, he was born just over 200 years ago, 1805 in England. Um, and his own story of coming to faith is an interesting one, but where his story really takes off uh, is in 1836 uh, in Bristol, England. And, and he, what he did was him and his wife opened a house uh, for orphans. And at that time, there were no orphanages. There was no child and family services. There was no one to take care of children if they had no parents. These children were left to be homeless or to become child laborers or probably both. And George Mueller, because of his faith in Christ, decided to do something about it. 
And so he rented a little house and he filled it up with a bunch of girls uh, who had no parents and they were the house parents. And when that house was full, um, they expanded and they rented another house and they rented another house. And soon they started purchasing houses and eventually they started building uh, dormitories for these orphans. And over years and years of doing this, they built uh, residences for hundreds of orphans in Bristol, England. Uh, the equivalent today is over $14 million of building projects uh, for orphans. The amazing thing about George Mueller's story is the way that he fundraised for this $14 million. He did no fundraising. He never asked a single person for a single penny. All he did was pray. For $14 million, all he did was ask his Father in heaven, would you give us what we need to build this next home? And God provided all those years faithfully. There's lots of stories that come out of George Mueller and his life of answered prayer. Um, I'll just share one with you. So later on in his ministry, when this had grown, they had an orphanage uh, with 300 children in it. And one morning, there was no food. For, for breakfast. There was nothing. And one of the, the workers came to George and said, George, there's nothing for breakfast for the children this morning. And he simply asked the children to go to the dining hall. Everybody sit down and they prayed. And they said, thank you, Lord, for this breakfast that you're about to provide. Amen. And when he said amen, there was a knock at the door. And a lady showed up and she had a cart full of bread. And she said, last night... God spoke to me and said, bake some bread for, for George and his orphans. And now they had bread for everyone for breakfast. And no sooner had she gone, there was another knock at the door, and it was a milkman who had a wagon full of milk, and his wheel had broken. And there was no way to deliver the milk before it would go bad. And so he asked George if they needed any milk. And God provided bread and milk for that morning. Lots of missionaries have similar stories. We have a good father. And the point of this passage is that this is how our father acts. He takes good care of his kids. I want to say just a few words about unanswered prayers. Because I know many of us are going there already. And we're thinking of times in our life where, where maybe God didn't come through. I don't want to get hung up here. Uh, we can talk so much about this. We can talk ourselves right out of praying altogether. A few words of wisdom from James chapter 4, 2 to 3. He says, You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So we know God doesn't answer selfish requests. Sometimes the things that we ask God for are not in line with his will at all, and God doesn't answer. But sometimes our requests are not selfish at all. They're very selfless. We're praying for the healing of someone else. And there's nothing in it for me. I just want this to happen. And it seems like this is God's will. It seems like this should be a good thing. And still, God doesn't answer. And I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, you've all heard the many reasons why God doesn't answer prayer. Um, it could be a million different things. I'm not going to go down that road this morning. God doesn't answer every prayer. But he does have a nature that is generous. He leans toward answering. I think sometimes we assume that he leans towards not answering. The default answer is no, and we've got to convince God to get on, on track with us. I don't think so. I think God's default is yes, especially when it's his agenda. And we still wait for God to answer in his way and in his time, uh, which might look really different than our time and our way. Uh, but when we're aligned with God, I think he's eager to answer our prayers. And let's not forget, we're in Matthew chapter 7. One chapter ago in chapter 6, Jesus taught us what to ask for. He said, pray that the Father's name would be made holy. Pray for his kingdom to come. Pray for his will to be done. Ask for your daily bread like George Mueller did. Pray for forgiveness of your sins. Pray for help and temptation. So we're asking for your kingdom. We're seeking God's will. We're knocking because there's temptation out there. I think these are the prayers that God answers eagerly. When you pray, Father, help me be a more loving husband, God responds, yes. I think before we even finish our sentence, he says, yes, I'm willing to help you. When we ask for wisdom to parent our kids well because we feel lost, God says, yes, wisdom is on the way. 
When we say, God, help me do a better job at loving my parents. Help me do a better job at loving my neighbor. God says yes, and he answers those prayers quickly. And when we have problems in our life, I think we have to assume that the father is interested. I'm interested in my kids when they have problems. I I genuinely want to know what their problem is at school or home, and I genuinely want to help. And I'm evil. Jesus says, I'm evil. And he says, if you can do this for your kids, how much more am I going to do this for you? How often do we discuss and stress about problems and forget to simply ask? Here's a quote. As Christians, we should never have a problem in our life that we haven't brought before the Lord. I'll say it again. As Christians, we should never have a problem in our life that we haven't brought before the Lord. The author of that quote is Jeff Bandman, but I thought it sounded better to say it sounds like a quote. You'll take it more seriously. How dare we complain about stuff? How dare we worry when we fail to ask the creator of the universe, who actually cares and is actually good, he's actually for us, How can we have problems that we don't bring before that Father? Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. As pastors, uh, one of our unwritten job description lines is to get our people to pray. And there's many tactics that we've used over the years. Um, Sometimes we've tried guilt trips. Uh, I, I did one of these when I was a youth pastor. I remember it well. We didn't have much internet back then, but we had these books on illustrations for youth. And I used one from there. And it went something like this. There's a, a man sitting in a restaurant at a table for two, and it's candlelit dinner, and he's waiting for his date to show up. And it goes on and on, and 10 minutes, and this date hasn't shown up, and, and 20 minutes, and an hour long, and his friend hasn't showed up. And he waits there all evening long, And finally, he leaves the restaurant and goes home. And you are left feeling so sorry for this man. And then you tell them, that's God. And he's waiting for you to talk to him. And you left him hanging. And then we feel so guilty. Sometimes we hold up extremes. Uh, People who pray, they get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they pray for four hours every morning. And we say, look, if they can do that, you can at least do 10 minutes a day of prayer. None of these work very well in motivating people to pray. Either guilt or holding up big examples. I think a good father is a better motivator to get Christians to pray than anything else. I think if we're convinced that God sees us as his beloved sons and daughters, we talk to him more often. We would bring more concerns his way. This is how young children act with human parents. A five-year-old tells their mom and dad every problem that they have because they assume Uh, One, that their mom and dad care, and they assume that, number two, mom and dad can do something to fix this. Why are we any different with our Heavenly Father? I want us to come as sons and daughters uh, in prayer. If we get that piece of our identity, I think it changes our prayer life significantly. The last line that we're going to look at this morning uh, seems unrelated at first, but I'm going to show you how it connects. Verse 12 says, Therefore, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is probably the simplest teaching that Jesus ever taught. It is, I don't even know what to say about it because it's so incredibly simple to understand. But really hard to do. Whatever you want people to do to you, do that to them. Would you like it if a friend phoned you up this week and said, Hey, I'd like to buy you lunch this week. Would you like that? We'd like that then go do that. Do that for someone. Do you like it when people are rude and condescending to you? No. Then don't do that to other people. Do you like it when people listen and are kind and helpful to you? Yes. Then listen to others. Be kind and helpful. It's such a basic, basic part of Christian living, and yet something that we seldom think of. You know, we used to have the WWJD bracelets. Um, Maybe we need to start a new bracelet, a WWIW. What would I want? Just remind yourself all day, what would I want in this situation? Do that for others. See, unfortunately, I think we've lost this teaching to children's Sunday school curriculum. And I don't blame Sunday school, not one little bit. Uh, But we teach this to little kids 
because this is something that they can understand. And then we make the mistake of saying, if this is for kids, it obviously can't be for adults. This is a kid's lesson. We do this with Zacchaeus and all kinds of other stories that have just become part of the children's department. And yet Jesus taught this for adults. This applies to kids, but this is for grown-ups like you and me. Um, And it seems at first disconnected to what we've just been talking about. Um, This whole thing about how God is a good father and he provides. But there's a therefore at the beginning of this. So we ask, what's that there for? And I think it works like this. If God is good, if he's a good, loving, heavenly father, then we are actually freed up to look out for the interests of others. If my father is caring for me, then I can look out for someone else. The flip side of this is that uh, if God isn't a good father, if he is a distant, uninterested, sort of fuzzy all-seeing eye up in the sky somewhere, if he doesn't really care, then look out for yourself. There's no one else going to look out for you. Look out for number one. This is how atheists live. There is no God to help you. There is no loving father. You might get help from other people, but probably only as much as you help them, and probably less. So as an atheist, at best, you break even. You put in your hard work, and maybe others will help you. The sad thing is that many Christians live by a similar principle. God is up there in the sky somewhere looking down, but he's not really too interested in us. If he's interested in anyone, it's probably that Chinese Christian suffering in a dark and cold prison somewhere. Maybe it's the missionary in Haiti who's just trying to get enough together to help their orphanage. It's the George Mueller's. God's interested in those kinds of people, but not someone like me. And when we think this way, it shows our view of God is either too small, that he's actually not big enough to pay attention to all seven billion people, or that he's actually not as good as the Bible makes him out to be. Or probably more than anything, we've failed to see ourselves as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. There's lots that we are in God's eyes, but first and foremost, we're sons and daughters of our Father in Heaven. And when we know our identity, when we're firm in that, when we know that God is not a disinterested blob up in the sky, when we see him actually as a loving, caring father, it frees us up to do to others what we would want to do to us. See, we're no longer looking to our spouse and our friends to meet our needs because we have a father who meets our needs. See, then I'm free. I can love you and I don't need anything back from you. Because my father's taking care of me. He's taking care of my needs. I'm not relying on you. I've got a good father who gives good gifts to his kids. And I'm one of those kids. And if this is not how we're viewing the world, then I think we need to pursue our identity as sons and daughters. This needs to be our number one prayer request. To get to know this good father that Jesus knew so well and he's taught his disciples about. This is a prayer that God will answer. If you don't see God as a loving father, ask him about that. Say, God, please show me. Show me how I'm your beloved son. Show me how I'm your beloved daughter. Teach me what this means. I think it will change a lot of things, and especially your prayer life. It will free us up when we get that to do to others what we want them to do to us. And Jesus says living this way is what the Bible is all about. He says this sums up the Law and the Prophets. The Law and the Prophets is a way of talking about the Bible, the Old Testament at the time. He says you can sum it all up in this one little sentence. Very few people live this way unless they first know their identity as sons and daughters. And in fact, this line, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, uh, summarizes the whole Sermon on the Mount. If you flip back in chapters 5 and 6 and 7, it's all through there. Would you like your spouse to cheat on you and marry someone else? Of course not, so don't do it to them. Would you like your enemy to show you mercy and love? Of course you would, so do that to your enemies. If you were poor, would you like people to give generously to you? Of course you would, so give generously to the poor. But all of this depends on whether or not we have a good Father in heaven. Uh, I went through the Sermon on the Mount, these three chapters, use the word father 17 times. 17 times 
Jesus uses the word Father. Do you think Jesus is trying to tell us something? Every time he says Father, the implication is we're sons and daughters. We have a good Father who gives us a bread, not a stone. He's good and he's for us. And the degree to which we get this is the degree to which we will be able to do to others as we want them to do to us. When we get it that God is a generous Father, that, you know, if God had a wallet and he had pictures of his kids in there that he loves, our picture would be in there. When we get that, we're freed up to be generous and helpful to others. And I think we're going to ask much more because we're going to start to relate to God as a good Father who cares. And I think this applies to our current situation as well. Um, There's lots of people in this world who have no idea that God is a good and loving Father. And when you don't know that, you panic and you fear. And we have a peace that comes with knowing that God is a good Father and that we're sons and daughters. So I just want to encourage us as a church family this morning to continue to pursue that, to seek God as a Father who provides good gifts. I'm going to close in prayer and then we'll sign off from this. Father, I thank you that you are a good father. Thank you that you are a father who loves his kids. I thank you that we get to call you daddy. I thank you that we're sons and daughters. Help us to know this more and more. Help us to bring more and more of our thoughts, our problems, to bring it all to you, knowing that you're good and that you're for us. Lord, we pray for our church community in this time that we would um, just draw closer together. We pray that our light would shine bright in our world. I pray that you would show us tangible and real ways to do this, Lord. And we pray that in all of this, your kingdom would come and your will would be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day. Done?